It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Allison Hill. Um, Allison did her PhD at Vanderbilt University in psychology and then moved to Oregon Health Sciences University. She was studying language in children with autism spectrum disorders and teaching statistics. And through our, a roundabout chain of events, uh, we wound up being colleagues in the education group at our studio, now pause it, where after being one of the education team, she went on to be their first product manager for data science communication. Allison's now living in Italy. Ask her about her flight over. Um, and she's now working for Voltron Data as their director of knowledge, where her job is to help find pathways for learning and sharing information that'll help make all of this easier. So please, a warm Canadian welcome to Allison Hill. That on, and then I will share my screen. Okay, am I good? All right. Um, I feel like I'm going to be in a vortex. It's going to be interesting to see this. Um, well, thank you, Greg, for the warm welcome. I appreciate that. I was a little nervous when you first told me that Greg was going to be introducing me, but I appreciate <laughs> the very personal introduction. Um, so uh, today, what I wanted to talk about was um, kind of some reflections back on uh, all of what Greg just said about my career, and a lot of it has been built around notebooks and using notebooks for various different tasks that I needed to do to be able to do the jobs that I've had. And uh, as I've kind of gotten further away from some of my work at our studio and working on uh, notebooks, I've kind of had a little bit of time and space to be able to reflect on what I believe are like now, for me, the happiest notebooks on earth. And so um, I'm excited to share those thoughts with you. And then hopefully uh, we'll have some time for some Q&A so you guys can ask me questions and we can have a little bit more discussion. And uh, since we all just ate, I am going to ask people to like raise their hands and stuff just to kind of give me like a show of hands. Um, and I'll ask people on Zoom also to do like kind of an uh, emoticon response. So I'm wondering just like everybody alive and awake there, can everybody on Zoom give me like uh, a raise hand or something to show me that y'all can hear me and you're all there and awake? Okay. There's a few people. We may have lost some people. <laughs> Oh, we've got some yeses. Okay, cool. So people know how to do this in uh, in Zoom. Perfect. All right. And I definitely see some familiar faces. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Allison Hill, and I'm currently the Director of Knowledge at Voltron Data. These are some of the ways that you can uh, get in touch with me. Um, my website is probably the best way to learn more about my work. Um, you may be familiar with some of my work when I was at our studio. Uh, I mainly worked on the our Markdown ecosystem of packages, which is a network of about, yeah, depending on how you count, 15 to 20 packages that all support the, um, the our Markdown ecosystem for publishing. And I was also working closely with the development team that worked on Corto, which as I've I've heard it mentioned a few times here since we've been here, which is really considered to be like the second generation of our markdown, trying to take all the lessons learned from the our markdown ecosystem uh, as we built it up over the years. And um, am I the one scribbling on the screen? Is that me? The green? Is that my reveal slides? I don't know. Um, that just surprised me. <laughs> but anyway, it's fine. <laughs> okay. No, weird. Okay, um, I don't think I've done something wrong, but anyway, uh, so these are the best ways for you to get in touch with me, uh, and I would love to connect. Um, I don't know what the future is of Twitter or Mastodon, but I have both, <laughs> and we'll see what shakes out on that front. Uh, this is also uh, a QR code for the link to the talk, so if you kind of pick up your phone and want to uh, see the actual link to the talk slides, you can find it easily there. Um, so what I wanted to share was a little bit about um, my three perspectives on notebooks, and they were largely shaped by my career at different points. So at first, um, as uh, Greg mentioned, I was an academic and I was a researcher and an educator. So I really started mainly as a user. I was using notebooks to do the scientific research that I needed to do to be able to ingest data, be able to do the things I needed to do with data, and to be able to collaborate with people who are not our users, who are not people who knew anything about statistics um, or you know didn't need 
need to know the code that I use to generate the statistics or plots, but they were people that I needed to collaborate with to do my own scientific research. Um, so I was a user first and I kind of feel like um, I'm going to date myself, but does anybody remember like those hair club for men ads back in the eighties where it was like, <laughs> it was like, first I was a user and then I was the president. And that's kind of where I feel like I came from. I was first a user of our markdown. Then I became a professional educator at our studio, which one of my, um, one of my best friends said, you know, as opposed to an unprofessional educator, like you were as an academic. <laughs> so I became a professional educator at our studio, which was an interesting role. Uh, and then from there, I transitioned uh, into product management for data science communication. And I'm kind of curious, because I know I came from an academic background. Has anybody here heard of the, the role product manager? Looks like some people have. Can you give me like a show of hands if you've heard of what a product manager is? So different from a project manager, I'll kind of explain it briefly. Um, okay, good. And there's some people, thank you for uh, uh, thumbs up online. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I often find that people get a little confused about uh, the, the label of product manager. And really it was an interesting role at our studio, especially on the open source side of things. Um, but I really um, uh, volleyed for myself to get that role because I felt really passionately that we needed to support better usability for our ecosystem of tools. And usually a product manager kind of sits at the point of making sure that the tool is useful, usable, and worthwhile um, from the company standpoint to, to build those um, features into it. So I sat at that place where I was constantly reviewing GitHub issues. I was intimately familiar with everybody's complaints about our markdown. Uh, I was attending meetups. I was kind of getting a lot of feedback from the community. So I was sort of like a little second brain running around knowing everything about our markdown and also knowing what was possible and what wasn't possible on the engineering side. So there was a lot of things that people wanted that just simply were never going to be possible. There was a lot of things that people wanted, but we didn't have time for. There was a lot of things that people didn't necessarily say they wanted, but we knew we could fix and make them better. So that's a lot of what um, what I did in that role um, and leading up into that role. And I still don't know why there's green scribbles on my screen. I'll try <laughs> what if I tried refreshing I my think screen? It might be an annotate. Did I do that? And if we just click eraser, maybe? What's the eraser? Or clear? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. I wonder how that happened. Okay. Sorry, I probably stopped something. No, it's probably me. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so kind of a prelude to this, there was this talk in 2018, and I'm curious, a show of hands, has anybody seen this talk? It's called I Don't Like Notebooks. Okay. Okay. So it's more of an engineering talk. <laughs> um, so uh, it was delivered at JupyterCon uh, by a human named Joel Groose, who had this like big, wonderful rant about how he didn't like notebooks. Um, and I loved watching this because for me, it was like a peek into um, how people were using notebooks and how they were not enjoying using notebooks. And especially as a person who's interested in product management, that's a really uh, great resource for data for yourself. Because a lot of times as a person, especially at our studio, you always hear the positives, the things like in these talks where everybody's been saying, oh, this like changed my workflow. This is amazing. Um, so what you really want is uh, the honest um, complaints as well. Well. So I used to joke that I had to kind of turned into the complaint box for our markdown. Uh, so it was nice to see somebody else lodging complaints against another product that was in my sphere and I could learn from it and kind of try to understand what people were using about, um, what people were using notebooks for and what they were complaining about. So here were some of Joel's complaints, and I pulled a lot of these um, from uh, one of my colleagues uh, at what is now Posit, uh, Eway's blog, and uh, this blog post is really great. I have it linked at the bottom. It's called The First Notebook War, and it was a really great, uh, great kind of long form post in response to this talk by Joel Groose. Um, so some of the select complaints that Joel had were hidden state and out of order execution, and this is using mainly Jupyter notebooks, I believe. Notebooks are difficult for beginners. Notebooks encourage bad habits. Notebooks discourage modularity and testing. Jupyter's autocomplete linting and way of looking up the help are awkward. Uh, notebooks encourage bad processes. Notebooks hinder reproducible and extensible science. Notebooks make it hard to copy and paste into Slack and GitHub issues. Errors will always halt execution. And notebooks make it easy to teach poorly. Notebooks make it hard to teach well. <laughs> So this was like a pretty, um, pretty negative talk, obviously. Um, and I really enjoyed watching it mainly because this has been kind of the opposite of my own experience of using um, the tools that I uh, was used to. And it kind of got me interested in this whole idea of um, how 
how how the tools that we use kind of shape how we approach solutions to problems and the expectations we have for how a tool should work and how a tool should um, fit into our workflows. Um, but then in a follow-up talk, I think it might've been a year later, uh, another human named uh, Jeremy Howard wrote a talk about how he actually likes notebooks. And this was kind of a direct like counter to uh, Joel Gruse's talk. And uh, I include the YouTube link on here. It's a really fun talk. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting also from the standpoint of somebody who's using Jupiter um, and kind of trying to lay out some of the things that they think Jupiter does really well. Um, and meanwhile, I kind of felt like I was on the outskirts of all these conversations, uh, just like knitting notebooks all the time and making them for all kinds of things. Um, and I actually did a search on my own GitHub just to see how many are markdown files I have authored and put into my own version control. So this is just since I even started using GitHub, which was later in my research career, and I couldn't use it for um, a lot of my research because that included, um, you know, HIPAA protected data of uh, individuals in my research studies. So uh, these were just kind of like my hobby R Markdown projects. So I did a search and I had 607 uh, R Markdown documents. So you could say that I've authored a lot of them. I've had even more shared with me. I've collaborated on a lot of these with other people. Um, and none of these uh, people takes kind of resonated with my experience. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting to study them and try to figure out like, what is going on? What is the disconnect here between their experiences in notebooks and my experiences in notebooks? So I think, you know, kind of stepping back, I think one of the problems is that uh, in both of these talks, we're still just talking about like tools and features, and we're kind of starting from the tool, and then we're talking down about what features that tool has, and then from there, talking about the things that we want to do with that tool and what it's stopping us from doing. Um, and then we're still mainly talking with engineers, um, and I kind of uh, took a step back at that point and realized like, maybe engineers who are making the tool aren't necessarily the best people to tell us what the tool is useful for. Um, I kind of think that we need to think a little bit differently about how we have engineering uh, teams in general who are creating tools for people to use and think of them more like in the Disney uh, world way of like Imagineers, like having engineers teamed with creative teams of maybe artists, educators, scientists, researchers, students, um, people who uh, you know could conceivably benefit and use these things and stress test them in very different ways than an engineer might um, originally kind of conceive of. Um, and I thought this was an interesting idea because I started reading up on um, uh, Disney World theme parks as part of um, my prep for this talk. And when I saw this concept of Imagineers, I was like, yes, that's exactly what we need in the tool space. Because I feel like the tools that we have right now um, I definitely am a big fan of some tools and not others, but I still feel like we're not there yet. And I feel like there's this great space for being able to make really awesome, amazing, empowering tools uh, if we get kind of a wider view and have a little bit more input from people who are not engineers and people who are um, kind of constantly using these tools and trying and experimenting with them. Um, so here's a quote from Walt Disney about this. Uh, he said that we keep moving forward, opening up new doors and doing new things because we're curious and curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. We're always exploring and experimenting. We call it Imagineering. It's the blending of creative imagination with technical know-how. And I think that's really the key is to have some creative imagination blended with the technical know-how. And in my experience working um, on the tools that I did work on, I think this really um, made for more interesting conversations and some more interesting solutions to problems instead of kind of uh, taking features as they came in and going, you know, going feature by feature and GitHub issue by GitHub issue. So I'll back up a second and talk about what is a notebook, because this surprisingly is actually a... Uh, a bit of a definitional um, war. <laughs> what is a notebook? Um, so Mike Bostak, the creator of Observable, uh, defined it in a way that I totally agree with. It's an interactive editable document defined by code. It's a computer program, but one that's designed to be easier to read and write by humans. Um, so I think I think that's a pretty spot on um, definition. Uh, Martin Fowler, uh, a comp computational notebook is an environment for writing a prose document that allows the author to embed code, which can be easily executed with the results also incorporated into the document. So I think both of those are kind of good starting points as kind of relatively simple definitions of what is a notebook. Um, and this is one kind of notebook. So this is the source code for a simple Corto document. And this looks pretty similar to an R Markdown document if you've used either one of those tools. Can I get a show of hands online and in person? Who's here used R Markdown? Okay, we've almost got like, I would bet 75% people here. Um, let me look at the Zoom. Looks like less people on the Zoom. 
more like 40% or so. Um, and then who's aware of Corto? Okay, 50% maybe. Um, let me check online, like some folks. Okay. So this is the Corto document. It's really similar to an R Markdown document in that we have this, this chunk at the top you'll see is uh, familiar. If you're an R Markdown user, this is what's called YAML. So this is like the metadata for the document. It's fenced in by these two, um, two levels of three dashes each. And that's how we have these key value pairs. So this is where you put stuff that like, maybe if you're used to Word documents or Google documents, you might try to um, put some of this information like in your file folder structure or in the names of the files. You might be used to doing like taxes 2019, <laughs> you know, that kind of file naming structure. But in an R Markdown document, you can have both the file um, the file name as well as when you get into the document, an actual title for the document, an author, the date, other metadata that's available to you. And then we have a little bit of markdown text below it. So you can see on line 12 that we start with um, a level two header. So this is one way to add like some nice structure to your document. And then on line 14 is where we have just a little bit of text. You can see it's not completely text because there's this like at fig air quality thing that looks a little codey, code-like. Um, and then below that is where the actual code comes in. So that's where you have those three back ticks and then the R and curly braces. And that tells you that this is about to be an R code chunk. And then what comes below that is the actual code that you're using here to create a ggplot um, visualization. So this is just one kind of notebook. Um, and it's the one that I am used to. So it's the kind of file that I'm used to opening up and not feeling fear when I see this kind of file, because I know exactly what I'm looking at when I have it. Um, so taking another step back is thinking about like, why why make a notebook in the first place? And this is actually one of my favorite um, ways of breaking it down. It's from R for Data Science, and I literally just copied and pasted from it. So these are Hadley Wickham's words, not mine. Um, so why make a notebook? The first reason is to communicate to decision makers who want to focus on the conclusions, not the code behind the analysis. And this was definitely how I used R Markdown when I said I started off as a user in academia. I was mainly working with people who didn't know R and didn't really need to see any of my code, but I needed to be able to work with professors who wanted to make sure that the analyses I was running were robust. I had, you know, taken care of missingness. I had taken care of all the things that, you know, a normal statistician should be paranoid about, um, but they needed to be able to focus on the things that they cared about and not see just like giant blobs of code because that would have like just been a non-starter for any kind of conversations to have. So that's how I initially started using our markdown. Um, for collaborating with data scientists, including future you who are interested in both your conclusions and how you reach them, i.e. the code. Um, so this was really how I used it when I became an educator. So when I started using our markdown, I kind of thought of it as like there, it had to happen when I was teaching because there was no way that I'd be able to grade assignments or be able to have any kind of back and forth with students if I didn't have a place to plunk text, right? Like they needed to be able to not just give me code, but they needed to be able to annotate something and give me some kind of narrative. I needed to be able to write something back and be like, hey, you know, why were you thinking this? What was the rationale behind doing it this way? So we needed a place to be able to put the text and I didn't want to deal with scripts and um, comments. And then the third way is as an environment in which to do data science as a modern data, um, as a modern day lab notebook where you can capture not only what you did, but also what you were thinking. So this is kind of like underlying all the use cases is like you're using it for development, but then you're also using it for these other two use cases at the top. And hold on, let me... Uh, I have a notification that's going off that's distracting me. Okay. Um, so after I got a little bit away from the R Markdown ecosystem, I started thinking like, what makes it so complicated? Because at the time when I first started teaching with it, when I was at uh, Oregon Health and Science University, I sort of just plunked people right into R Markdown. I sort of just like gave them an R Markdown document. And my students um, kind of like, you know, had a pretty good... Uh, pretty good response and they were pretty uh, game to try new things, but they got to this point where they started asking me more and more questions about like, how does this work? What, is, what are these things that you're giving us? Like, what are, what are these like knobs that I can turn? And I realized that the actual notebook space is complicated for a number of different reasons. And I think when we're talking about notebooks and when Joel Groose was talking about notebooks and Jeremy Howard was talking about notebooks, the ones that they like and the ones that they don't like, we're talking about different elements of um, different things at the same time. And we're calling them all notebooks. So there's one part, which is like your authoring framework. And this is how you write your code and your text. And so when we talk about something like Jupyter or Corto or even Observable, those to me are authoring frameworks. 
And then you have a language engine and a markdown flavor, and that colors exactly what you write. And usually your authoring framework is pretty rigid about allowing some um, language engines and allowing some markdown flavors. Maybe there's just one or maybe there's more, but usually your authoring framework has already like laid this out. You often can't just kind of say, I want to use whatever language engine I want or whatever markdown flavor I want, but these are choices that are made for you and they're important ones. And they're actually ones that differentiate some tools from others. Um, you also have file formats. So that's the actual thing that you save. And this was often one of the most confusing things about talking about our markdown with people is that there's a .rmd file format, there's an R markdown package, there's extension packages that weren't called R markdown, but that depended on R markdown. So whenever people would say like, what is R markdown? I was like, it's 10 different things. And it really depends on what you're using, <laughs> which part of it you're using, because it can actually be a number of different pieces of the whole workflow that you're using. So file format is important. With Jupyter, for example, the file format is is IPy, um, IPy Y and B. Uh, with our markdown, it's .rmd. With Corto, it's .qmd. Um, and I believe with Observable, it actually can read in a JavaScript file. So then you have a local editor, and that's where you write your code locally. So this is like where you can see the source and you can play around with some kind of UI elements. So a lot of people, if you're used to R Markdown or Corto, then you're used to using uh, the R Studio IDE as your local editor, right? You can also use VS Code, for example, for Corto. So you can use a couple of different IDEs um, to use some of these different frameworks. And then finally, you have a platform editor. And so this is where kind of magic currently happens. And this is a space where there's a lot of change happening right now, especially in um, enterprise settings, because you've gotten to the point now where people are really enjoying notebooks, but they want to be able to share them. They want to be able to have a link that they can give to some other people, but they want to go way beyond that. Because at this point, we've made it to the point where like, yes, sharing a link is helpful, but you would like to be able to have like a Google Docs-like experience with your notebook. You'd like to be able to have people hop into your text, your code. You'd like to be able to invite people to collaborate with you. And then you'd like to have some kind of UI elements that help you to be able to preserve the state of what you're looking at, maybe be able to iterate in a browser, that kind of a thing. So there's a lot of different tools now that are being developed around the different authoring frameworks that would allow you to interact with the notebook instead of just having it be like kind of a static asset that you're just kind of looking at in a web browser. So I started breaking these things down um, and I realized that this is why I probably confused my students when I first started teaching our markdown is because these things are really variable. And when we're talking about these different um, notebook tools, you could be talking about any one of these kinds of different workflows. So with Jupyter, for example, as the authoring framework, you can have three different language engines. You have all these different markdown flavors. You have one file format that's supported. You have two options, I believe, for local editors. I think there's definitely more, but these are the two main ones when I pulled people um, for what they use. And then you actually have kind of a growing platform editor um, uh, space right now. So there's Jupyter Hub, Google Colab, Notable, Hex, DeepNote. All of these are platforms that support interactive uh, Jupyter notebooks. You can also do Corto as your authoring framework. And then from there, it makes some key choices for you where you can use Python, you can use R, Julia, Observable JavaScript. You've got Markdown flavors. I put Pandoc Star Plus because it's Pandoc that differentiates it from uh, other authoring frameworks, but it's sort of enhanced Pandoc. Um, and if you want to ask me questions about that later, you're welcome to. Um, there's some intricacies there. So it's it's true to say Pandoc star plus, but um, you know all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, file format supported, IPy, uh, YNB for Python, QMD and RMD. You've got a local editor, which you have a choice of now, and then platform editors. Our Studio Cloud is one of the ones that's interactive and Jupyter Hub as well. And then our markdown, kind of similar span if you go all the way across. I have R star for both Corto and R Markdown because technically Nadar has 62 um, language engines, so you can use all kinds of different languages. Um, and then I included Observable on here as well. Um, I gave this talk originally at the Observable uh, Insight Conference uh, two weeks ago. So I did a little bit of a deep dive into all the different notebook platforms to try to get a little bit more of a polyglot sense of, uh, of the space. Um, and before I go on, I just want to clarify because there's definitely, since y'all are an expert on Markdown crew, um, I, I know uh, the difference between a notebook and notebook mode. Um, so I feel like I need to say this. So Jupyter notebooks are notebooks. Jupyter is the product. That's when I talk about Jupyter, I'm talking about that. Observable notebooks are notebooks, but observable is the product. Um, Corto and our Markdown notebooks are a little bit different. They're both plain text documents and they do have two modes for execution. One is called notebook mode. And when I say notebook, I don't actually mean notebook mode for our markdown. I never use notebook mode. It's one of the execution modes. Um, 
I think it's a not great mode, but uh, that is uh, what some people think I'm talking about. I'm just using the word notebook because it's become the noun here. Um, Because if you talk about our markdown document as separate from these other things, you're kind of not doing it justice as what it is, because it is all of those three things that I listed out before. So um, I usually use our markdown in Quarto in what's called batch mode. Um, So I use it interactively in the RStudio IDE, but then I also um, will knit meaning uh, or render, meaning I run it from the top and just run all the chunks um, in one document and then create some kind of output file. Um, so in reflecting back on like being a user and then an educator and a product manager for uh, in the notebook space, um, I, I kind of realized that there's, there's this bucket of features, these buckets of features that I think are actually really important, um, but I've seen them kind of being like spottily introduced in different in different tools and they allow for very different um, user experiences. And I think this is why some people um, will say that they don't like notebooks or they don't like it when a notebook gets shared with them because it's maybe a jumbled mess. They don't like how there's a bunch of code at the top splatted and then some visualizations and then a bunch of code splatted at the bottom. So you'll hear this kind of thing a lot. And I think that part of it is because the tools themselves are kind of not enabling the workflows that we actually need. And then I think it's also that we don't train people who are making the notebooks what are good best practices for like good hygiene for making a happy notebook. So I think for making a happy notebook, and I'm not sure all of these are possible in every single tool. So these are more like my pie in the sky dreams would have like, would follow these four key principles. Um, so one, um, and these are inspired by uh, some principles that uh, Walt Disney uh, used to, um, to design Walt Disney World as well. Um, so one is suspended reality. And I'm going to walk through each of these. Um, another is multi-sensory experience, which I'm actually like a huge proponent of with notebooks, especially with HTML format. Uh, details matter. Um, as someone who has had a lot of notebooks shared with me, um, I think that this is a really important feature to think about as both a notebook author and as a notebook tool maker. And making it shareable. Um, and I think we've gone, as I mentioned, kind of beyond sharing just static HTML documents at this point. I think there's a lot more that needs to be um, shareable about documents. So I'm going to walk through each of those four key principles and kind of talk through some of the things that you can do as a notebook author to make your notebooks kind of follow those principles, but also some of the things that you might want to query your own tool and your own authoring framework for to think about how it might be stopping you from making your notebooks feel a little bit happier. Because they really should be like a happy space for you to be able to jump into, create code, create visualizations, be able to easily share it. Like it should just be a really nice, pleasant experience that makes your life easier and not harder. And that hasn't always been my experience uh, with notebooks myself. So principle number one is suspended reality. And I think this is really important with notebooks. And I think a lot of times people feel like they need to make notebooks that are complete 100% accurate from top to bottom that show the reader everything they need to know. And I don't necessarily think that that's accurate. I think a lot of times you're making a notebook for somebody else to consume. And there's a lot of code that I think you should have in there and you can have it accessible, but not necessarily all splatted into the notebook. So a lot of times, a lot of the code at the top can really be distracting. A lot of it can, um, can kind of detract away from the audience experience, the reader experience. So I think having some kind of sense of suspended reality is helpful. Um, so I thought this was kind of a, a hilarious idea that I didn't know actually existed at Walt Disney World, but uh, there's this thing called Utilidors. Has anybody here heard of this at Walt Disney World? So I guess the problem was that Walt Disney found it jarring to see characters out of place. Uh, so he, I, I guess the story goes that he was like leaving one um one event where there was a character there and then he saw them like kind of taking a break and walking along the path. And he was like, no, that like breaks everybody's suspended reality while they're here. So when they built Walt Disney World, he insisted on them building this utilidor system. So utility corridors underneath. So there's all these pictures of when they first made Disney World of building this entire tunnel system underneath it. And what it does is it gives the characters a place to go. So when they're done, like when Cinderella's done, you know, during her wave time, she goes down there and, you know, then she can kind of like take a load off, take off her crown and relax to get to the next event. And nobody has to see Cinderella, you know, taking a water break or going to the bathroom, anything like that. They can just pretend like Cinderella or Mickey and Minnie, they're all just perfect characters that just exist where they need to see them. Um, so it's an intricate web of tunnels that underlies the entire park and it enables characters to navigate to their respective worlds without ever appearing out of world or duplicative. Um, and I think this is exactly how I 
now think about my code going into a notebook is that I'm building these utilidors for my, my data to be able to travel, my code to be able to travel. I want it to be accessible. I want it to be visible to the people who need to be able to see it. But a lot of times it's just kind of functional code. It's just things moving somewhere from here to there or, you know, doing some simple transformations that I don't really necessarily need to, you know, it, it's a little pedantic to kind of explain to somebody, oh, I'm doing a mutate to make, you know, this date a, a year instead of by month. But like, there's just some things that you don't necessarily need to narrate for everybody and that you can legitimately hide. They're still there. And that's why we're using a notebook is because everything is reproducible. So I think a really good notebook tool should make impossible for you to build some utilidors for people. So I think of it as like less magic, but more plain text logic. So being able to use something in plain text in your notebook to be able to hide certain things or be able to pull certain things in when you need them. And these can include configuration settings. These are often in what's called the YAML um, in the document header or in external files. Um, preferably you have a tool that allows you to define your own variables. And if you go to the HTML version of my slides, you'll see that some of these are linking out to Quarto documents because these were features that I volleyed for when I was um, uh, at NowPosit. Um, so I think being able to define your own variables and being able to pull those into your notebook document are really important for a lot of different projects, especially multi-document projects like Ariel was just talking about with Bookdown. Um, outsourcing a script or a document. So I don't know if anybody's ever done this before where you've had an R script that's external to your notebook, but then you read it in into your R Markdown document. This is a wonderful hack, especially if you're developing something that's like a publication worthy um, product or something that's more of a report for other people to consume. So once you like have iterated and made all the wrangling code that you need or all of the data processing code, you can outsource that to an R script and then just be able to run it in one single line. And this is a great way to be like, you know, refer readers to say like, okay, if you want to see how this data was made, like kind of if you want to see like all the details of how the sausage was made here, like here's the link, you can go to it and show it, but you don't necessarily have to plop it all into their experience when they're reading it. Um, reusing code chunks in different places. Uh, this is something that I use a lot, um, and I think it's a really helpful feature to reduce duplication and reduce your copying and pasting when you're in the document. Makes your life easier, but it also makes it easier to build more of these little tunnels underneath that allow you to kind of know where the data is flowing. Um, in an example that I'm going to show you in a second, we had a paper for the Palmer Penguins uh, um, uh, publication that we recently had um, published in the R journal. And we use this kind of thing a lot to be able to create different, um, tunnels for the different, uh, the different plots that we were trying to make and the different statistical analyses that we're trying to show off with Palmer penguins. And then also being able to do conditional evaluation of code. And I think this comes up actually a lot, um, being able to say like, okay, don't evaluate this code chunk if the value is greater than or less than this, or don't evaluate this code chunk if you've got this kind of output format. There's a lot of different reasons why you'd want conditional evaluation of code, and you'd want to look into a notebook tool and be able to try to figure out exactly uh, how it can allow you to make your code conditional or your code chunk run conditionally, or even have text show up conditionally. That's also very empowering. Um, and I don't know if we'll have time for this. Uh, if we do, I'm going to, let's see, we started at 118 ish. Um, so I'll, I'll leave this as an example for the reader. Um, this is a link to a uh, GitHub repository for the Palmer Penguins paper that's been published recently in the R journal. Um, and you can see this was not a painless exercise for me to do. And I was a person who worked on our markdown for years. Um, it was a really painful publication to make. Uh, it didn't work great. But I do think that this paper has some really good examples of how we built some utilidors around um, kind of moving the data and trying to keep track of where the different data sets were coming and going and what kinds of analyses we were trying to show off at different time points. So principle number two, multi-sensory experience. Um, I did not know this, but at Disney World, uh, they actually have something that they've built and they actually have it patented. You can actually look it up. There's like nice diagrams online of how this works, but it's called a smellitizer. And it's a system that blows air across a scented substance to make the air smell a certain, and I say like ideally good way. <laughs> so there's like little sweet shops around um, and where they were like, they're literally piping out the smell. So it's not just that like, you know, they're baking something that smells good. They're literally making it um, permeate the air and make you kind of have that like full immersive experience. And their, their philosophy is that it makes it a more memorable experience too. Now, I don't think that notebooks have a smell like that, but I do think if you've heard of code smells and feels, I do think that notebooks have smells and feels. Um, has anybody here ever been delivered a notebook from somebody else that they thought had a bad smell? Like everybody knows it, right? <laughs> There's some bad ones. Um, and I think 
there's different flavors of bad, but here are some of the ones that I wrote down. And if you have any other ones, um, feel free to shout them out when I get done reading this. Um, so I have seen ones with like literally no meaningful headings, um, like truly like just a dump of text for like just scrolling forever and there's no navigation. Um, or worse for me, and this is my own personal pet peeve and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't like cute, cute or peppy headings. I don't like it when it's like, let's dive in exclamation mark or like, let's get after it. Like, I don't need it. I don't need that kind of like hand holding, And it just sort of upsets me. It's not, it's not meaningful and it doesn't help me navigate. And I don't need a pep talk. Um, no meaningful heading hierarchy. And so I have seen ones where instead of not having any meaningful headings, they go like H1 through H6. So if you're familiar with Markdown, it allows you to go up to level six and have like these deeply nested hierarchies of headers. You should not do that. It's not helpful to anyone. No one can keep track of what level they're in. Even if you number them, you just get completely lost. You have like heading one, 1 1.1, 1.3, 1.4, 4.4, 5. And you just like, you're never going to use that. It doesn't help. So just because you're organized in that way and you've got it in your head, it doesn't actually help anybody. Um, no navigation. So this kind of goes along with no meaningful headings, but usually there's some kind of like thing at the top that tells you like how to explore this notebook, how to consume it. And then usually there's like, you know, things that are clickable. If you have an HTML, if you have the freedom to have an HTML notebook, you should definitely make sure that you have a, some kind of clickable table of contents. And ideally it's sticky on one side. Um, no description of the data. Um, and I am definitely at fault for doing this when I've shared notebooks with other people. Um, taking just a few sentences to describe data to someone who's going to be consuming your notebook or even for yourself, like making sure that you freeze frame what your data set actually looked like on the at the time and date that you last made this notebook, it can be really, really helpful uh, for debugging later. Um, no logical order of things. And um, this I've seen a lot, especially in student work when I was critiquing um, student notebooks, I would just kind of get lost in their thought process and you would feel like it was very stream of consciousness code. And usually that's not the, the final product. That shouldn't necessarily be um, how you organize things. So I think that notebooks do have a scent. And um, I'm pulling here from some research on um, uh, usability and uh, information foraging is a term that people use in usability research. And I think this is exactly what I'm doing when I'm trying to consume a notebook, even if it's my own notebook and I'm going back to it. I'm trying to figure out like how, how to access the information that I need based on the text that I can read and skim very quickly. And so information foraging in the web world refers to how users behave when they're exploring a new website, why they're clicking on certain links and not others, um, how they're assessing the quality of a link or what's inside of a link and the page context surrounding the link to judge what's on the other end of the link. So I think you're gonna do yourself and your readers a lot of favors. If you think about somebody who's coming into it and thinking about laying out an information sent for people to be able to figure out from top to bottom, how to be able to consume that notebook. And I think there's a few simple things that you can do to make your notebook smell better. And I think these are also things that if your tool doesn't allow you to do that, it's a really good reason to maybe look at some other tools because there are tools that do allow this and prioritize it. So one is having a clickable table of contents. And I put the little um, safe, the little push pin there because I think it should also kind of be sticky and on the side so that I can click around and look, look for things that I want. I think this also makes it easier for people to debug, but it also gives you a really quick snapshot when you're looking at those headers all together um, to be able to see like, what is the structure of this document? Like, what are the main topics that this person thinks are important? Um, adding useful headings. So again, making sure that there's actual content in the headings, like no empty headings. Um, conclusion is fine. Introduction is fine. But anything that's more like, okay, next step or, you know, step number two, step number three, those are not terribly helpful to the reader. So trying to think about like snippets that you can use with real text, real words, with content that can help people follow that information sent through. Um, I tend to aim for H2 and H3 levels only. So I think of the title of my document as an H1, and then I try to only go as deep as H3. Um, and then I'm a really big proponent of using sentence case because it's a lot easier for readers and enhances readability. And then limit yourself to five or six H2 sections max if you can. So trying to make sure that in a single document, you don't go haywire and try to do everything all at once. And this is also a really good case for having like more modularity of your code and having kind of a multi-document setup. Once your project gets too big, you don't want your document just to like keep blossoming and blooming. Like that's not really a pleasant experience for anybody to debug. And I've definitely made those for myself. I've had ones that are just like huge scrollers and they get really, really hard to consume and understand. Um, have topic sentences. I know this is just kind of good writing, but some people forget about this. Most people are skimming and most people are just kind of like trying to get 
as little time as they have and get the most information possible. So having a topic sentence really helps them. If you have useful headings and a great topic sentence, a lot of the times the rest of your text should just be supporting that and they shouldn't have to read the rest of the text to understand it. Um, describing your data, five W's and one H. So who, what, when, where, why, and how. Really helpful if you have even just like a section about like the data. Um, that is really helpful to ground anybody. And especially if you're a student and you have a professor who's going to be looking over your work, like keep in mind that the professors tend to have about 10 different projects going on at any one time. So they're not like as deeply um, like simmering in the data as you are. Like you probably have some data sets that you're working with. You know all the variable names, you know, like, you know, you've got one row per something, you know, all the Entities really well, but every single other person that's going to be consuming your document doesn't have that in their heads immediately. So giving a refresher is a really good idea. Uh, laying things out in logical order. I think this actually takes more time than you think. Um, I usually try to think of a beginning, middle, and end for my story for my reader. And I will caution that it, the logical order is never, I've never seen it be the chronological order of the things that you actually tried. So if you start recording everything chronologically and you think like, okay, first I tried this, then next I tried this, then next we did this. Nobody's following that because that was like one thought process that you had. And it could have been like a number of different decision trees at every point. But like, once you get to the end of it, you have knowledge then that you didn't have at the beginning of the document. You don't have to keep the document like true to the, your thought process. What you'd like to do is keep the document true to the knowledge that somebody should get out of it. So that's usually the most common feedback that I have for students when they'd give me a notebook is like, it, it, nobody cares anymore what order you thought about things. Nobody cares. Just simplify. Like maybe you, you maybe five steps in, you did the simplest analysis and that's where you should start, you know, put a linear regression at the top instead of the last step. Like just thinking through for yourself, what are the things that they need to take away from it? And what is the best way that I could have organized my thoughts? It can be, again, like a suspended reality. It can be like, the thought process you wish you had had. And that's hopefully what like a good notebook would help you do is kind of hone your thought process and get better at asking questions and get better at having more focus. So principle number three, details matter. Um, this I think is really interesting um, from the standpoint of uh, Walt Disney World. They say that when a single detail is wrong, you lose the entire experience in magic. So they have all these little things around the park that reduce the chances of losing the magic. You cannot buy gum so that you don't just end up stepping in gum and having your whole experience ruined, right? Um, they're actually an official no-fly zone so that you actually can't have planes flying over you while you're enjoying Disney World. And apparently you are always within 30 steps of a trash can. Um, so it just keeps everything kind of nice and clean uh, and keeps it so that, you know, there's things that you, you can reliably predict about human behavior and you can make their experience better. So a good notebook tool would be a little bit proactive in making sure that you don't step in it and make you feel like you can actually make it a pleasant experience for users. So one thing that I think notebook tools should be focusing on and that you should query your own notebook tool for doing is letting easy things be easy. And some of these things are easy styling. This was like one of the most common uh, pieces of feedback that I had in my GitHub issues across every single R Markdown package we ever had was like, authors want to use fonts and colors. They have to use them for their job. They have to use them for brand um, uh, you know, uniformity. A lot of times when you're working at a university or when you're working at a company, you have style guidelines that you need to follow. A lot of times it's also for really important reasons around accessibility. So sometimes you need to be able to control the actual font, the font size, the font colors, the con color contrast of these things. So these these things are really important to let people use. And also they just give you joy as a person who's writing the notebook so that you don't have just something that looks like everybody else's default. And readers ended up wanting font fonts and colors too. So everybody wants this and almost no notebook tools actually make this actually easy for you to be able to do. And I think this is something that we really need to uh, make easier for people and make it something that's like a plug and play thing where it's one of the first things that you do. And it helps you then kind of track your own thought process and feel a little bit more in control of the things that you want to be in control of. So that's an easy thing that should be easy. Um, easy layouts. I know Ariel just had a whole talk on some amazing layout work that he's done. And it seemed like it probably took them a long time to figure out. I feel like layouts should actually be a lot easier than that. Most people's problems when I was looking at people's layout questions in the um, the GitHub issues of the R Markdown ecosystem where people just basically wanted a basic grid with rows and columns. Like everybody wanted to be able to use Bootstrap or something like there's all these accessory packages that we, people were building. And it was all basically just to get like multiple columns and a few rows in there. 
So those are things that you can make things really nice and easy. And especially for readers, if you think about it, if you're reading something, a lot of times it's really a pleasant experience to be able to see text on one side of a column and a plot or a table on the other. Having everything be linear and stacked all up and down is actually not a great user experience because you're constantly doing things in text like if you'd see the table above or if you see the figure below. And if you had things side by side, it would be a lot easier. So it's kind of a win-win. I think that should be a lot easier. It is actually easier in Corto. So I will say that that is one thing that um, I was really, really pleased with when they got that right. Um, easy show and hide code and results in the output. This is something if you're an R Markdown user, this just like comes as a default. You would be shocked that this is not something that's very easy in Jupyter, um, as far as I can tell in most of the platforms that I've been able to try. Um, it's really not easy to be able to say like, hey, this is an, a code a code chunk that I don't want to be able to show um, what it does or what the output is. I just want to mute it. I just want to like hide it. That's really hard to do. Um, and an easy run from the top mode. Um, most things have this where you can be able to start at the top and then go all the way down and knit something all at once. But that's a really important key for reproducibility. And it's how you go beyond having a, a notebook that's just useful for you to having a notebook that's useful to you next week, a notebook that's use, useful to you if you get a new laptop or if you have a new collaborator. Being able to run it from the top and always be doing that constantly um, is very things that should be easy. Um, and an easy way to skip or freeze a code chunk. So this, I think, is very helpful to be able to say, like, I want this one to not get rerun when I do that run from the top. I want to just freeze it. Maybe it's an error or something like that. And you want to be able to show what the error looks like when you had it. There are certain things that you'd like to be able to do that with. And then I think hard things should be possible. Um, so like, I think the cat and the goldfish should be able to talk to each other. <laughs> um, I think you should be able to use version control with your notebooks easily. Um, uh, there are some new tools that are being developed for the Jupyter uh, authoring framework that make this a little bit easier. This is one thing where our markdown has it in spades, like our markdown and core to our plain text. So they're easily um, diffable and you can use them with version control. And that makes a huge difference for being able to collaborate with other people. Um, I think you should be able to export and download your source file very easily. I think you should be able to save all your plots as image files. Um, one of the main reasons that I used notebooks initially was that I never showed the notebook to anybody else. I would just download all the plots as image files. And then I would go into meetings with my collaborators and show them the plots that I had made. And we would basically do like eye tests. Like, do you like this plot or this plot? This, this color palette or this color palette? And if you had had to go through a single linear document and look at them all like that, you're constantly scrolling up and down, scrolling up and down, scrolling up and down. So being able to have control over that and get your images and your source file code, like everything you need to be able to make in the notebook, you should be able to get out of the notebook. I'd like to be able to extract all of my code into a script. This is also relatively easy in our markdown. You can use the Perl command to do this. Um, and this is really nice because it makes people feel a little bit less like they're spending all their time toiling away in your specific notebook platform, but their code is locked up in there. And then if they want to reuse that code and they just want to forget all of the text that they had in there as narrative structure, you can do that. You can just be like, give me all my code and let's just leave the thoughts behind uh, instead of forcing people to go through and copy and paste each thing out of it, which is just like a not a fun task. Nobody wants to do that. Reproducible environments, this is something that I think should be possible way ahead of time and that we should really provide better tools for making this easier. Um, I am certainly a person who has uh, uttered the words like, I know I should use RENV in this project, but I'm scared <laughs> because RENV is the way to have reproducible environments with R packages, but I have not often had a seamless experience with that. And I think our notebook tools should make that easier. So my last principle, number four, is make it shareable. Um, and this again going back to the walt disney world frame uh they actually have specially designed things in the park to make your pictures like more likely to come out awesome so the concrete is red and that's a brainchild of disney and kodak to create more vivid photographs so that you don't have like crappy gray concrete in the background and it also makes the grass um the green grass appear greener in pictures uh, and then also cinderella's castle faces south so that means that the sun is never directly behind it so it's almost impossible to take a bad photo of yourself in front of Cinderella's castle. So now I don't actually think that we should take all of these lessons from uh, Walt Disney and apply them to notebooks. What I actually want to do is I want to be able to ba take bad pictures. Like I want to be able to share things that are not the perfect final product because I am definitely a person who has made a notebook and then waited until the last minute until everything was just right before I shared it. Um, so this got me to a, a Twitter discussion with um, somebody who is a kind of our markdown power user, uh, TJ Marr, uh, where he was asking me like, what the heck is a notebook supposed to be? And I, I kind of threw out a definition that I, 
I am starting to lean into more is that it's a snapshot of a database creative process that leads you somewhere new and next. And I think it's like, we have to kind of embrace that about a notebook. Like it is a snapshot. It is not necessarily like your, your single reproducible workflow. It's a snapshot of where you were based on the data that you had. And it's a place for you to have some kind of creative process and be able to record it, know what you tried, know what worked, know what didn't, and then be able to build off of that. And then the product might get better and better over time, but it doesn't have to be the same notebook. Those can be different notebooks over time, but each notebook is kind of a snapshot. Like the second you pull in the data from most data sources, that's already a snapshot of the data anyways. So I think we have to embrace the fact that notebooks are kind of a point in time product. Um, and I would like to be able to better share outtakes, bloopers, and in-between things. So I always think of that this quote from Mary Poppins, where she says, we're on the brink of adventure, children. Don't spoil it with questions. Um, I feel like this is actually exactly where you want to spoil it with questions. And I wish I was better able to quickly share incomplete thoughts, even with errors in code. I'd like for it to be shareable and not have to be able to run perfectly in order for it to be shareable. I want to be able to share things that won't run, but that you can see what did run and you can see the actual errors that I got so that you can better help me because one of my main purposes of using notebooks at first was to help somebody was to get people to help me debug. I'd like to time travel to different versions with output. So being able to see like what the previous versions results were is really helpful. I sort of hacked my way around this when I was a researcher where I'd have like the date in my file name and then I'd pull up the different versions of the date so I could compare the different reports. I know that there's parameterized reports. I know that there's ways to do this, but I still don't think there's actually a great way for you to be able to say like, here's the version of the same document from two weeks ago. Here's the version of this document with this data set and here are the differences. I think that's still too challenging. Um, I want to be able to stash bits of code out of sight, sort of with utilidors, be able to keep them, but be able to save them for later. So all my code that sucked and didn't work, because I need to be able to share that again and be able to ask for people to help me debug it. Um, and I have this vision of a future where we can annotate easily what to look at and what not to look at. I don't know if anybody's ever had the experience where you've asked for feedback on a document and you've tried to ask for it early because you're trying to be proactive, but everybody's sitting there coming back to you with like, well, this part isn't finished yet. This part isn't finished yet. And sometimes I'll literally have text in there that's like, this part is a work in progress. This part I haven't tackled yet. And then I'll still get feedback from an advisor or a co-author who's like, well, you really need to work on that section. I'm like, I know, I know I'm trying to share things early so that I get the early feedback. So I would love to be able to more easily be able to have like red light, yellow light, green light, like here's what you should look at. Here's what you shouldn't look at and be able to help people figure out like how to consume that document. So if you can imagine if you've got a notebook in a GitHub repository right now, you would probably give somebody a five minute like road tour of what is in that document, how to use it, what to look at. And it wouldn't, it just seems so easy for us to be able to build tools that allow people to kind of program that in and say like, here's the code chunks that I want you to look at. Here's the parts where you should look at. Here's the places where I'm working on. So just don't look beyond this. So uh, in some, I think <laughs> I have a lot of notebooks and I think that they are, uh, they're all special in unique ways. They're kind of like little special snowflakes. Um, but I think that they're very useful and I think they're useful for a few reasons. I think they're useful to record my, my code and my thought process. They're useful to get feedback from others. They're useful to get help getting unstuck from things. They're useful to help others get unstuck. There's really no better way for me to help somebody than to be able to see the output that they got frozen in times. Um, if you've looked at the Reprex package, for example, it's actually built on um, the ability to create things like our Markdown does. It's useful to teach with, useful to learn with, useful to collaborate with, useful to publish work for my career, um, useful to debug, and it's useful to iterate on code with. So in summary, I talked about four key principles that I think uh, tool makers who make notebook tools should make um, built into the tools themselves and hopefully give you some ideas for the things that you have control over. And if you don't have control over them, then maybe look at different tools or feel free to you know, file GitHub issues to your friendly open source uh, authoring framework. Um, so one was suspended reality using utilidors to save your sanity and your code. Another is creating that multi-sensory experience. And for us, obviously, we we have mainly control over the navigation and um, being able to make your actual organization of your notebook kind of have a better notebook smell. Uh, details matter and the famous words of Larry Wall, easy things should be easy, hard things should be possible. And finally, making it shareable. And for me, that's especially things that don't work, things that aren't necessarily like the pretty picture version of my notebook. I want to be able to share those and more quickly be able to get some feedback on it because that's one of the most useful things about notebooks. 
So thank you guys for the invitation and for being here. And I'm hopeful that we have time for questions. Yes. Questions? Questions? Supporting, uh, questions? Are there any questions in person? Alex? Uh, yeah, so thanks for the fantastic.